Thank you very much. It's great to be uh, part of this uh, really exciting and important event, and I, I hope it uh, uh, is the, the first of many uh, follow-up events uh, uh, in the future. What I'm going to do is, is shift the gears a little bit to talk about some conceptual and, and uh, organizational issues uh, around health data systems, and there's really three or four parts I, I'd like to do. I want to highlight some of the challenges that we face with health data systems in a context of high volatility where there's constant change in the healthcare system and then talk about some solutions of, uh, that we can potentially employ uh, to help support evidence-informed decision-making uh, in this uh, sector. And I'll be drawing particularly from my experience working in uh, long-term care, home care and, and mental health settings uh, for some of the examples. Um, so let, let's think about healthcare system where the, there is the, this uh, comment that the only constant is change. If we think about changes that happen in healthcare, many of them are long-term changes that happen over the course of decades. Um, so if we th think about some examples of those, population aging, and that's important uh, because it leads to a population with more complex needs and more uncertain outcomes in healthcare systems and potentially higher demands for certain kinds of, of systems. For the last 70 years, we've seen changes in female labor force participation. Uh, many of those changes are now over and, 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 and concrete, but there's also different things happening in terms of career patterns over the life course. And that has implications for needs for childcare, which we haven't really figured out uh, fully yet today. But in terms of an aging society, it also um, uh, poses some challenges for systems like home care that are very heavily dependent on informal supports. And if people have competing time demands of work responsibilities, um, child care responsibilities, and elder care, that gets to be a real uh, challenge. Geographic mobility, people are moving around more, and when your kids move away to another part of the country, even if it's a couple hours away, and now you're an older person in, in need of informal support, that changes the, your access and availability of support that you may have. And then trends of urbanization mean that the places where people are moving out of become, um, uh, they age rapidly and have great needs that may not uh, be easily met in, in those, uh, those regions. But all of these are trends that happen in decades and half of a century kind of uh, uh, time period. And we were working on them forever and haven't particularly done well in, in solving all of them. But then every once in a while, big things happen that are sudden, possibly unexpected, depending on whether you say we should have expected a pandemic uh, or not, but there are things that where the world changes quickly and have to cope with that. So COVID-19 was a great example of that, of something that suddenly happened and changed everything in the health system. And I would say potentially on par with that in the not too distant future is, is the uh, emergence of misinformation and anti-science uh, thinking in the world. That could have as big an impact on our the future viability of health data systems as uh, some of these other acute threats to, to the health of, of the system. So the, the example I want to talk about was COVID in, in long-term care. So let's, in our mind's eye, go back to the second week of March 2020. The pandemic hadn't been uh, declared yet as having come to the shores of, of Canada, but we knew things were, were, were happening. We weren't in lockdown. Yet at that point, we had virtually no evidence of what the impact of, of COVID was going to be uh, in long-term care uh, settings. And the only data we really had were data coming from China focused in acute care hospitals and a few case reports in some long-term care homes in, in some jurisdictions. And so all we knew at that point was that age was going to be a, a, an important risk factor and multimorbidity was likely to be a, an important uh, risk factor. At that point, a policy decision was made to emphasize the protection of hospitals uh, over long-term care. So that second week of, of May, my team collaborated closely with folks from CHI-HI to pull together available data that we had for long-term care. And we had data from four different countries and we looked at these two characteristics, age and comorbidity. If we look at the age 80 plus category in long-term care homes, that was uh, about 70% uh, of folks in those settings. If we look at multimorbidities, over 88% of folks in long-term care had multimorbidities. So in terms of what WHO was telling the world, long-term care was the sector where the overwhelming majority of people were at their highest risk categories. 
We also did have some data available to us though from impl implementations of systems in the long-term care setting where we could take those measures of comorbidity and age. We could look at home care clients and we could look at nursing home residents in Canada. Nobody had COVID data because COVID wasn't really here yet. We knew it was coming. So we thought, well, what's a proxy for what COVID might be? And we had information on the pneumonia diagnosis. So we could do some simulation modeling of what might pneumonia uh, look like uh, in combination with age and comorbidity. And generally what you can see is as older people, uh, as people get are older in home care, nursing home settings, 90 day mortality goes up. If they have comorbidities, 90 day mortality goes up. If they have pneumonia, 90 day go mortality goes up. When you put them all together, it's bad. So we, in the, the first two weeks um, uh, before the pandemic was declared, did a synthetic estimation of what we might expect to see in terms of deaths in long-term care. And the number I came up with was 1,500 deaths. And I thought that's crazy high because remember that SARS killed 44 people. In, two, in, in the early 2000s. So I thought 1,500 feels like a bit of an overestimate. We released the information to the relevant uh, decision makers. We worked with CHI-HI to get information on this comorbidity measure out to long-term care folks. And here's what happened. In the first two waves of the pandemic, 15,000 people died in long-term care. So the best data that we had available at that time was a vast underestimate of what, what, uh, what happened. 80% of our deaths in that initial time period happened in long-term care. We had data to raise the flag, but still a lot of deaths happened. So it's worth thinking about, well, there we were in a situation where we actually had as good data as we were gonna get. Why weren't we able to sort of stop that, that from happening and what might be some things that could change that could help? And perhaps some of these things weren't going to stop it anyway, but it's worth uh, sort of thinking about some things that we could uh, perhaps uh, have, make a difference on. So I'll talk about four or five different factors that affect our capacity to manage uh, change in a healthcare system. One is simple health data gaps. And we should particularly be concerned about data gaps for vulnerable populations. So if we think about older adults, we actually have very robust data systems in place for home care and long-term care settings in the country. In fact, not just robust, world-leading, not world-class, world-leading systems uh, for those two sectors. Canada is, is well-regarded in terms of data for those settings. But in retirement homes and assisted living uh, settings, almost no data. And I'll go back to this graph where I said about 10,000 were in nursing homes. We had data on those folks that other 5,000 were folks in retirement homes where we had no data. Uh, we also have pretty limited data about the clinical characteristics of older people in acute care settings and primary care settings. We have some data, but not nearly as comprehensive as you might want for full uh, clinical management of their complex needs. In um, a, a mental health uh, context, we have some data standards in some provinces, but most of what we had is a discharge abstract database for inpatient mental health, which is fairly limited in terms of the scope of the mental health issues that coverage covers, and we have no real national standards for community mental health. And when it comes to child youth mental health and child, children in um, uh, uh, home care settings, we have really no national standards in those contexts. And those are three really important vulnerable populations that we do need to be concerned about. I'd like to dive a little bit deeper now though into long-term care, which I've just described as a data rich environment. So some of our strengths are we have widespread implementation of what are known as the inter-eye assessment systems. Inter-eye is a 40 country research group that I belong to. It, these assessments cover multiple sectors. Most provinces and territories are covered uh, by it. But right now, most provinces and territories are using older versions and older IT systems uh, uh, for that. And I think it's fair to say that they're underutilized in, in clinical practice compared to how they could be used. So this schematic shows on a national basis the implementation of these instruments. The red dots are mandated implementation of these instruments in nursing home settings. So as of December, we already had 20 million assessments on over 6 million unique Canadians with those inter eye data holdings. So that's about 7 billion data points. So that's why I'm saying in that context, we're very uh, data rich. Um, we also have um, great mechanisms for reporting on quality of care with risk adjustment um, uh, methodologies for that. There's a robust 
IT infrastructure to manage capturing data in long-term care settings and sending the data to Kaihai. Kaihai has a fantastic national reporting system where you can look up information about the quality of care in 1,500 nursing homes across the country. And we have very robust mechanisms for reporting uh, publicly on, on quality. Some of our weaknesses in that sector is we don't have great information about quality of life, about the person's subjective experience other than two provinces uh, have adopted a, a common standard. And public health reporting was the Achilles heel at the start of the pandemic. Nobody really had data on outbreaks in long-term care settings. In fact, it was media folks calling homes to get information about the outbreaks. It wasn't something that we had national information on. When we think about structural measures, about how the healthcare system is organized and staffed and so on, and process measures of what we do to people, we're kind of weak on that side of things. We need to improve the system in, in that way as well. But what we're really not very good at is sharing information across settings. If a home care client goes from home care to an acute hospital, the home care clinical data don't follow them to the hospital, even though the home care clinical data are very relevant to outcomes in, in hospital settings. Okay, so that's data gaps. The next is inconsistent standards where there's not a data gap. And uh, so I've asked the, the question, is a rose by another name uh, still a rose? So there's this idea that we can measure things in a whole bunch of different ways. We can bring them together and through the magic of computer science, suddenly we have equivalent measures. Um, and so that we don't necessarily need data standards is the hope. Well, there's some scientific considerations around this if we have inconsistent measures. In some cases, you might be able to create crosswalked comparable measures from, from different uh, items uh, measuring a, a concept, but always you're going to convert to a cruder measure, either a, a simple, more simplistic response set or any problem, no problem is, is what you're gonna have to do with that. So you lose granularity um, uh, in, in that kind of uh, context. The other kind of inconsistency can be coverage of historical time periods where something is measured one point in time and another uh, um, uh, setting it's measured another point in time. Sometimes that's not a problem if nothing big has happened. So if you're looking at 2019 and 2017 data in Canada, maybe not a big deal. But if you're trying to compare 2019 data to 2022 data, those comparisons may not be feasible because of, of the magnitude of the, the uh, impact of, of the uh, pandemic. Also, in, in terms of historical data, we can probably still use those data to look for associations in data, in, in data. We can create decision support algorithms based on older data because the way things work are probably somewhat time independent unless there's dramatic changes in, in clinical practice patterns. The bigger problem with inconsistent measures is actually a social and political problem. So if I measure the happiness of my long-term care home residents in one way and another hospital or home measures, measures it in a different way and we report on the front page of the Globe and Mail, Herdes' healthcare system is worse because people are more depressed. My first line of defense is they didn't measure it the same way, so it's not a fair comparison. My second line of defense is they have different uh, patients, so it's not a fair comparison either. And that's why we have to have robust risk adjustment methods to allow for fair uh, comparisons. And in fact, these social and political um, considerations are somewhat more daunting than the technical considerations in measurement uh, in some cases. Next kind of example is something I call uh, the denominator problem. So if we're doing survey sampling or population sampling, the big problem we have with, with those kind of data is non-response bias, where you end up with an unrepresentative sample. So if you have a 12% or 20% response rate, you're probably not gonna be able to make uh, generalizations to the general uh, population. And that's the, the bane of the existence of, of uh, survey uh, researchers. Sometimes people will sort of do periodic samples for different time periods where they'll sort of occasionally go to a population, get data. Those can be good if you have a good response rate, but then you might miss some important event that, oh, I just happened to not get the data at the start of COVID, so I don't know what, what happened then. So those are kind of well-known problems with sampling. In, in my world, we get excited because we say, well, if you have routinely data, uh, collected data, both administrative data and clinical data at the point of care, and you gather that on everybody, sampling's not a problem because you've got everybody. So in Canada, in several provinces, 
we have everybody who goes into a nursing home, everybody who goes into a home care program in Ontario, everybody who's admitted to inpatient psychiatry. The problem of the denominator is, well, what, what exactly is home care? And what exactly is a nursing home? When you do a survey of names that people use in Canada for a home that provides 24-hour care with some social services and some clinical care to people with cognitive impairment and ADL impairment or functional impairment, you find find 44 different names in Canada for what everybody else would otherwise call a nursing home. And in home care, it's even harder to, to define. And so we may have census level data for people in a given sector, but we still don't know whether that's the full denominator of, of people uh, in need. The next example that in part was relates to my, my sort of point about um, uh, COVID is the uh, inertia and the mobilization of, of evidence. And there's two examples I'll, I'll give you. One is that when the world is changing rapidly, like those first weeks of COVID, getting data out uh, very quickly is, is essential. You can't do that with paper records written by hand in a filing cabinet. You can't really do that with unstandardized data because nobody can make sense of unstandardized data, as I said. Narrative notes from the chart may not be very great quality, especially if you're from the old school uh, nursing notes uh, where you write, had a good day, slept well, ate well, that's not going to be that informative to, to anybody. But an important problem that we faced with the older Kaihai systems is that data were submitted in batch every three months, and then data quality was checked and then verified and then resubmitted. So you're looking at a six to nine month lag uh, in data, but in some provinces that adopted the newer Kaihai systems, it's near real time, so they had data right away. And so being able to sort of get near real-time data is really um, uh, critical in terms of responding to quickly emerging challenges. But the other one thing that's an interesting problem is the ability to have analytic capacity to handle these complex, rapidly changing um, uh, data. You know, so there's not a lot of people out there that can work with these kinds of, of complex uh, data and they're pretty busy people. So getting them to give up time in their research careers to do something completely different is a challenge. Not having access to data is, a, is an important issue, but there's also this issue of risk aversion among some researchers. Some people didn't want to touch this because of career risks. I certainly felt a bit nervous when I said 1500 people could die from COVID um, based on what I'm seeing. And I was dead wrong on the, on the conservative side uh, for that. And then look how complicated this is. Just all you gotta do is look at the case chart. So most of those deaths happen in that first little bump. Look at how many different ways this changed. With SARS, we were over and done with in a, in a couple of months. This is a marathon, SARS was a sprint. And understanding all the twists and turns in there is an enormously complicated task for anybody to do and requires highly sophisticated abilities and good quality data to be able to get at that. There's two new kinds of privacy issues that, are, that have emerged that are also important uh, concerns for us. One is the growing um, uh, recognition that we need to think about vulnerable subpopulations that may be at risk for bad outcomes like uh, poverty and stigma and marginalization and barriers in, in system navigation. The challenge is even though we have these uh, small, the, these important subpopulations, the N is often small in data, so for privacy reasons, for privacy reasons, we either exclude them from the data set or combine them into a category that becomes kind of amorphous and, and hard to define. So even though we all know that we care about these important populations, privacy constraints often make it difficult to analyze data, data about those populations. Linked data are interesting because by linking data together, you can address more sophisticated questions. You can get better outcomes if you're interested in looking at, say, mortality and, and hospital length of stay for home care clients and, and so on. You can get system level views uh, with this and you can look at populations that move between health settings and static populations. But the problem with linked data is now you've got double the size of data holdings and the privacy risks are even greater uh, with that. This is an example of why you should be interested in people moving between different settings. So this is a, from a paper that we did that's got 1.8 million unique individuals looking at cognition. So if you want to understand the distribution of dementia in the population, here's a representation across nine different healthcare settings. The populations that are of interest are inpatient psychiatry, there we see not so much cognitive impairment, and nursing homes where you see a lot of cognitive impairment. 
people who are in inpatient psychiatry that previously were nursing homes have much more cognitive impairment than the general inpatient psychiatry population. And people that are in nursing homes that used to be in inpatient psychiatry have more severe cognitive impairment than the general nursing home population. So from a health system management point of view, we really want that ability to track people as they move through the health system, but privacy constraints may limit our ability to do that kind of analysis. I'm gonna end off, got a couple of minutes uh, yet around some opportunities and risks around AI systems. AI has great potential in terms of dealing with complex analytic challenges. But we have to be careful that we don't rely on black box solutions. We, the data have to be interpretable for how they how these systems work. It's no use to have a system that is only valid for one data set that we can't replicate in other contexts. And we have to have in science a deeper understanding of what's actually going on in order to get at the truth of relationships between human characteristics. And we need that information in order to identify interventions um, um, that, that work. From a clinical and managerial uh, point of view, we want to think very carefully about training people to be curators in how to make decisions in uh, healthcare settings. So people need to be able to work with AI data and other data to make informed um, uh, decisions. There's a potential that AI solutions can help reduce error in medicine. You know, the radiologist who missed the sign of a tumor, that maybe AI can help with that. But there's also a possibility that if we're not careful, people could get into a, a mode of robotic decision making where they say, oh, the computer said this, so this is what we got to do. And the clinician's no longer thinking as a clinician. Very importantly, we need to switch our thinking to not get too excited about the idea of data driven decision making. And remember that we're looking at evidence informed uh, decision making. Data do not speak for themselves. You have to think about a value based framework where you're framing the questions you're at, uh, you want to answer and you weigh different types of, of evidence to, to make a, a decision. Because in healthcare, your choices ultimately are ambiguous and they can involve opportunity costs. You can do one thing or that thing, but you can't uh, do both. And so you have to understand the value framework of Canadians to see how the decisions you're making with the data you've got correspond to what they want. And so we had a, a near miss asteroid hurtling to earth event in terms of health data for the, uh, the elderly in around 2021. There was a very active discussion about using something called the clinical frailty scale to triage and limit access to hospital services and ICU services in the province because we were getting at that number of, of overcapacity in ICUs. And so there was a discussion about a cut point to be used with that clinical frailty scale had that been used, it would have severely constrained access to intensive care or acute care for middle-aged people with physical disabilities, but 90% of home care clients would have been cut off from hospital services and every nursing home resident would have been excluded uh, from those services at that point. And that was based on that algorithm. Now imagine, had we made that, that decision, how people would have thought about that algorithm in the future and their willingness to give you data about their frailty levels because now they know if you have that information about me, you're not gonna let me go to a hospital in, in the future. Luckily, the ICU pressure subsided and the tool was never used for that purpose. But in my view, that was, that was a near miss event. So my final slide on some things that we can do, we have to put effort into ensuring public trust and confidence. And I'm not now talking about the privacy of data, it's in the veracity of the science behind the data. We need to really um, focus on making sure that people actually believe the research that, that we're doing because that is, is at, at the heart of our ability uh, to contribute to, to knowledge. I think we need to think about some type of a professional standards and accreditation for people who are researchers, analysts, because technical solutions aren't the only solutions we can use for protecting privacy. There has to be some regulatory oversight about the people that actually work with uh, personal uh, health information. Synthetic data have some uh, useful applications, but they're not gonna solve everything for us. We need to move all our systems to near real-time capabilities, particularly in the home care and long-term care side of things. We need to fill in some of those gaps with new measures, but they have to be interoperable with the existing measures that are there in the system. 
We need to use all of our analytic tools available to us, including but not limited to AI. Sometimes you don't need AI. Sometimes a simpler solution is all you need and it works uh, just fine. And we need to work with decision makers at all levels to make them better at evaluating and interpreting and, and communicating and acting on evidence that come from disparate uh, sources. Thank you for your time and attention.